Dear participants, I am very happy and proud to be among you to talk about coconut at this special and interesting conference, Niu Now, and this week of coconut knowledge sharing with the people of the sea. I prepared this first part of my contribution with Carmel Pilati from Papua New Guinea and who works in Fiji at the Pacific Community, Vincent Johnson, an Englishman who has been working with me for 30 years on coconut, and with Heranui Chant and William Ellicott, who work on coconut at the Directorate of Agriculture of French Polynesia. I will talk about coconut biology and about how farmers and gardeners can better conserve, breed, and use their own traditional coconut varieties. I will first illustrate the amazing diversity of coconuts, coconut trees, and their biological behavior. Then I will document the hard job achieved over centuries by farmers for coconut selection and breeding. I will describe four useful Polynesian traditional classifications of coconut as female and male. Then I will discuss how merging the traditional knowledge and the agricultural science can help farmers and gardeners to better conserve, breed, and use their own traditional coconut varieties and reach a greater autonomy in seed nut production. Coconut trees show an extraordinary varietal diversity, first expressed by the color, size, shape, and the composition of the fruits. Varieties also differ by the size and the growth of the trunk, by their abilities to produce or not plenty fruits or a lot of toddy, and by their tolerance to diseases, pest, and climatic hazards. This diversity remains little known to the public. It is underexploited at the cultural, commercial and industrial level. Coconut varieties are now classified in four main types, but the two most abundant categories are tall types and dwarf types. Tall types represent at least 80% of all existing coconut palms. They generally form quite heterogeneous cross-pollinating populations. Talls can grow at a rate of more than 50 cm annually when young and flower at 6 to 10 years. The dwarf types are generally associated with man habitat. They are often called dwarfs, thin-trunked dwarfs, fragile dwarfs or Malayan-type dwarfs. Dwarf types grow at a rate of 15 to 30 cm annually and usually start flowering 12 to 30 months after field planting. Apart from their usually short height, these varieties show a combination of common characteristics, self-pollination, small size of organs, precocity, and rapid emission of inflorescences. Then, how to recognize them? Just have a look at the stem and at the bases of the leaves. Of relatively smooth aspect and clear color, the stem carries regular marks. Each leaf produced by the palm creates, on the stem, a leaf scar in the shape of a crescent. The gap between two leaf scars makes it possible to distinguish the two types of coconut palm. For the tall type, the distance between two leaf scars is generally higher than 5 cm. For the dwarf types, it does not exceed 2.5 cm. Compact dwarfs varieties are native to the Pacific region. Traditionally called as New Laker or New Lair, they were already known in the 1850s at least in Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa. Compact dwarf varieties are also available in Hawaii and are generally called Samoan dwarfs. Except for the very short internodes, which reduce trunk height and produce a dense leaf canopy, many other characteristics resemble those of tall varieties. Compact dwarfs and their hybrids are probably one of the best possible future for coconut agriculture. Palms are of small in size, less sensitive to cyclones and damages caused by Oryctes beetles than many other varieties. In 2023, a modification of the international nomenclature was proposed to define a particular coding for the international names and abbreviation of compact dwarf types. Understanding the reproductive biology of the coconut palm is crucial for increasing breeding efficiency. The coconut inflorescence, called spadix, by botanists, is 1 to 2 meter long. It consists of a central axis or rachis, with 10 to 40 lateral branches called spikelets, or rachili by botanist. The inflorescence has both male and female flowers. Spikelets are about 30 to 55 centimeters long and bears 100 to 300 male flowers from the top to down. Most of the spikelets, but not all, 
have one or more female flowers at their base. The total number of female flowers in an inflorescence from zero, especially at the first flowering, to a few hundreds. The male flowers are the first to open, beginning at the top of each spikelet and proceeding towards the base. The male flowers are small and oblong in shape, and start to mature as soon as the inflorescence opens. Their bracts open and pollen is released from the anthers. Each normal inflorescence produces approximately 200 to 300 million pollen grains. In nature 75% of shed pollen losses its viability after 12 hours. This point is important if we want to develop a pollination method that can be used by farmers and gardeners. The female flowers are globular in shape. Their diameter is 2 to 3 centimeters. These flowers become receptive early in the morning as indicated by a reflexed and moist stigmatic surface. In addition to the stigmatic appearance, nectar containing 9-12% to sucrose is produced from the receptive flowers throughout the day. When receptive, the stigma is expanded as three erect teeth. The stigmas remain receptive to pollen for one to four days before they dry up. Once pollination period is over, the stigma necroses, and you can see a black dot at the end of the flower, at the place of the stigmas. If fertilization is successful, the flower generally develops into a coconut. Although both wind and insects bring about pollination, insect pollination is more predominant. During the first six weeks from pollination, up to 70% of flowers fall off. At harvest time or after 11 to 12 months from fertilization, an average fruit set of 30% or less is common. Installing honeybee colonies in coconut plantations and seed gardens for enhancing pollination and fruit set is beneficial. In French Polynesia, several farmers said that if the plantation is well maintained, the presence of hives for bees increases the harvest by 15 to 30%. So, each coconut palm is bisexual, and produces with both female and male flowers. It can therefore pollinate itself. Most dwarf-type coconut palms reproduce in that way. In tall-type coconut palms, the pollination mechanisms are more complicated. To understand them, it needs to be known that the female phase of an inflorescence corresponds to the period when female flowers are receptive and the male phase begins as soon as the inflorescence opens and ends when the last male flower falls. In some varieties, all the male flowers ripen and fall before the female flowers are receptive. In that case, cross-pollination takes place. It apparently involves two different parents. But another phenomenon further complicates this mechanism. It is also possible for pollination to take place between two successive inflorescences on the same palm. The female phase of a given inflorescence may partially coincide with the male phase of the following inflorescence. The coconut palm is therefore a species in which different reproduction options exist side by side. Most coconut growers have the practical experience of harvesting seed nuts on a coconut palm selected for a specific purpose, such as high yield, sweet coconut water, or sweet husk, and get different characteristics on the progeny but most of them do not know why. In 2018, during the surveys for preparing the varietal catalogue of French Polynesia, I travelled to around 15 islands and atolls. I have been working on the coconut tree for more than 30 years. However, it was only when I visited Aratika Atoll in the Tuamotus, that I understood how difficult and thankless the selection work carried out by the farmers was, with a low success rate. In 2023, no scientist has yet published on this subject. In Aratika, a coconut palm with soft and sweet husk, called kaipoa, was reputed to be medicinal. The husk is whitish when mature. Its owner wanted to multiply it. He collected 12 seeds from this coconut tree and planted them. He waited 10 years to see the result. Of the 12 coconut palms planted, only one of these progenies reproduced the special characteristics of its parent. 
Only one of the descendants produced soft and sweet coconuts. Another farmer from Aratika, by the name of Emil Juventon, owned a very rare bold type coconut palm. These are huge green coconuts, very rare in the Pacific, whose nuts have a flat bottom which allows them to be used as containers. He planted 80 descendants of this palm in his coconut grove. Of the 80, only one gave back a bold type coconut tree. The problem is that when we harvest a seed from a coconut tree, we know the mother of this seed, but we do not know its father. To select more effectively, it is necessary to understand and master the mode of reproduction of coconut trees. We will see how during this training, although the world is currently undergoing considerable change, it is hoped that the children of farmers will continue these selection processes, as their parents did, and as it has been done for hundreds of generations. Thus, farmers have tried for millennia to create varieties of coconut palm. They succeeded, but it also failed countless times. This required immense effort. The rare times it has succeeded is that the farmers have had brilliant intuitions and great perseverance. Some farmers have benefited, consciously or not, from geographically isolating the coconut palms they have selected, for example by planting them on an isolated motu. Among their traditional knowledge, Polynesians classify coconut and coconuts palms as female and male according to four distinct classification systems. One female, male descriptive grouping is linked to the shape of the fruits. Two more groupings are linked to the way of fruits germinate. And the last one is linked to the general aspect of the palm. Females are always preferred to males as planting material. The first traditional classification is linked to the shape of the distal part of the coconut husk. If pointed with a small nipple, Polynesians will classify the fruit as male. If the three protuberances terminate by a concavity, the fruit will be called female. Three informants from different islands told that it is much easier to remove the husk from these female fruits than from these male fruits. During the during traditional Polynesians festivals, competitions were organized for the speediness of removing the husk from the coconut. In Aratika, we met a winner of these competitions. He told us that he won because it was able to select these female coconuts in the heap of fruits available to participants. The second classification is linked to the way the sprout emerges from the husk when germinating. If the sprout emerges from the place originally occupied by the peduncle, the fruit is called female. If the sprout emerges from elsewhere, the fruit is called male. Our first observation tends to indicate that the fruits germinating as female have a thinner husk and a bigger coconut inside, so the sprout can easily emerge through the husk at the peduncle level. This could be checked more precisely by conducting a scientific experiment comparing the size and composition of these female and male fruits after growing them in a nursery. The third classification occurs when seedlings are aged from one to three months old at the nursery stage. The seedlings having large, wide and oblong first leaves are said to be female. The seedlings with long and narrow first leaves are said to be male. The variation in leaf shapes could originate from genetic differences between seedlings coming from cross-pollination or from selfing. The fourth classification as female, male deals with the general aspect of the adult coconut palms. A fecund and productive palm, producing many coconuts is called female. Palms producing few or no coconuts are called male. It should be noted that the Polynesians are not the only ones to assign a genus to trees. In Europe, in ancient times and in the Latin language, the names of trees were mostly feminine. The tree was perceived by the Romans as a feminine being because it bore fruit, or because it housed a nymph, a feminine deity. Then, in the French language, on the contrary, all the nouns of trees became masculine. I think I prefer the vision of the Romans to that of the French. We would like to achieve a kind of fusion between traditional and scientific knowledge. It is not always easy, as in this case. 
On one hand, Polynesian farmers use at least four different ways to traditionally classify coconuts and coconut trees as female or male. On the other hand, botanical science tells us that every coconut tree is bisexual. The two kinds of representation, first traditional and second botanical, are both useful and should be preserved. The first one allows farmers to select better seed nuts. Scientist view is useful to better control crosses between coconut palms for breeding. We must manage to keep these two representations. Now, what is the challenge for coconut farmers and gardeners? In our opinion, farmers should appropriate the scientific knowledge on coconut reproductive biology. The breeding carried out by the farmers is often not very effective because they do not control the reproduction of their coconut trees. When they harvest a seed nut, they know the mother of this seed nut, but they do not know who its father is. Scientists use a reliable method of controlled pollination, but this method is very expensive, difficult to implement, and gives a low yield. During training sessions held in 2023 in Papua New Guinea and Fiji, we started to create and test simpler methods of controlled pollination that can be easily used by farmers. These methods are based on bagging individually female flowers or bagging whole emasculated inflorescences. We will try to test these methods also in Hawaii. The author of this presentation has been conducting research on the coconut palm since the 1990s. He has led or participated in research and development activities in around 40 coconut producing countries. In addition to numerous specialized studies, he contributed to the publication of several synthetic documents having had a considerable impact on the coconut industry. We can cite the Global Strategy for Conservation and Use of Coconut Genetic Resources published by the International Network on Coconut Genetic Resources, abbreviated COGENT, the Coconut Risk Management and Mitigation Manual for the Pacific Region, and varietal catalogues. Among these catalogues, we can cite the first catalogue produced for the international collection in Côte d'Ivoire, the World Catalogue of the Cogent Network and more recently, a catalogue produced for French Polynesia which constitutes the most accomplished and most impactful form of this work. He manages numerous websites and a YouTube channel dedicated to the coconut tree. The creation of attractive catalogues that allow the identification of varieties and forms is a crucial step for the in-situ conservation, dissemination and even marketing of coconut varieties. At the beginning, the first catalogues we produced had a fairly rigid structure, with systematically a page of text and a page of six standardized photos to describe each variety. Then, the format of the catalogue evolved to become more attractive to the public, with a more sophisticated layout, an introduction illustrated with large photographs, and more freedom in the description of the varieties, even if scientific rigor is always preserved. Here is an example of an amazing Polynesian variety of compact dwarf, with a flexuous trunk like a snake. In our last catalogue, it was described over four pages, because it's really worth it. Here we see pages 1 and 2. Here are pages 3 and 4 of the description of this snake coconut tree. We really need to do the first catalogue of this type for Hawaii. Same kind of coconut varietal catalog is also needed from many Pacific Island countries, such as Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, Tuvalu and many others. I am willing and very interested to participate in these crucial projects if you need me. Dear participants and colleagues, thank you for listening.